Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radigan here at the AUVSI's annual conference uh, here in Washington, D.C., and it's our honor to be talking to the Commanding General of the United States Marine Corps Combat Development Command, Lieutenant General Eric uh, Smith. Sir, thanks very much for the time. Hey, thanks for letting me do this, Vago. Much appreciated. Uh, in, if you very much enjoyed uh, your talk. Uh, you you based it on uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, the 38th Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, General Berger, uh, put a 27-page guidance out, uh, really seen as quite game-changing, saying, hey, the Marine Corps shouldn't be de uh, defined by the equipment it uses, for example, uh, something the Marine Corps has always prided itself, right? We have V-22s and we've got Harriers and we're different than everybody else, but focused very much on what that future warfighting environment looks like, what are the capabilities uh, the service needs. His job is to do the design, your job is to develop to that design. Talk to us about how that guidance is fundamentally changing, how uh, your priorities and what you and your team are doing. Sure, uh, great question. So that, that 27 pages from the Commandant was some of the best top-down guidance I've ever seen in 32 years. What he said in there is we often ask hey, for the Navy, what, what, are, what are you doing to support my warfighting ability as opposed to hey, what do I bring to the fleet commander? That's a fundamental shift. It's not really a fundamental shift. It's a shift from the current phase because in the last 18 or so years, we've been in Iraq and Afghanistan and we're returning to be in the fleet marine force. So in, some, in, an, area or in, an, in an area of operations the size of the Pacific, when you have the Navy focused on sea denial and sea control, what is it that I bring to the fight in support of the numbered fleet commander to assist them with sea denial? That, that is really what we're focused on. And that fundamental thing, that fundamental characteristic of being in support of the Joint Force, the JIFMIC, the Joint Force Maritime Component Command, or the numbered fleet commander, that is central to everything we do now. It's naval. That, that is the big broad theme that runs throughout. Um, when you uh, look at priorities, uh, you were in Okinawa as the commander uh, out there, and one of the things that's true about the Pacific is that everything is really far away from anything else. So when you go 1,000 miles, you're still 1,500 miles away from where you might be, even though you guys are forward, and everything about what you do is, you know, that you're not, you know, there's a tendency of thinking you've got to fight your way in, you're already there, and a lot of American forces are there in the region you'd be working with. But as you look at that theater and its demands and its challenges, the Marine Corps has been getting heavier. If you look at an F-35, it's heavier than the Harrier it replaced, the same thing with the V-22. All the amphibious ships have the box that they've got. There's been a drive to become lighter. How, how do you need to rethink how you fundamentally operate in this area? to do all of the things you have to do from the high-end war fight to the dissuasion to, to, to phase zero? Yeah, so great question. So we, we haven't gotten lighter in a long time. We have slowed, in some cases, the, the rate of weight gain, but actually dropping weight is incredibly hard. So I've told the, the folks that do force development with me, I'm not adding another ounce to the MAGTAF. When you bring me a capabilities development document, I'm going to show where are you lightening the load. And it's everything from at the little micro level, from a helmet and a, and a flak vest, all the way up to a vehicle, right? To whether it's a ground vehicle, et cetera. We've got to get lighter. And so I, really, I'm, I'm the control mechanism for that. And then the Commandant says he's looking for less exquisite, more numerous, less expensive, and it has to be lighter. If we're using unmanned systems to transport our stuff across the vast distances of the Pacific, then you do run into a Cuban square problem. It has to be smaller and lighter. So really it kind of falls to us to actually just have the discipline to accept risk and take less capabilities, non-exquisite, and go more for a, gen and I won't say generic, but a less exquisite program that will buy, uh, or in and of itself, that will be less expensive, and we should then theoretically be able to make that smaller and lighter because it has less capabilities, and I've accepted a little more risk. We have to take some risks here. Um, when uh, technology, you know, you were talking about whether or not you were a digital immigrant or not, uh, and you had a couple of really, really good lines there um, about, uh, you know, getting into a self-driving car, for example, and, and stuff like that. But fundamentally, as technology changes and goes through step changes, Right, the iPhone fundamentally changes how we think. We don't remember telephone numbers anymore. Right. Um, I do, you do, our kids pretty much don't remember them because they're in their phones. Um, so it wires and, and you do everything you do differently, for example. How do we need to think and how are your, you and your team thinking about what that future environment looks like and how you can make some significant step changes that change the game on potential adversaries, for example? Yeah, so, so you're right about things like phone numbers and, 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 and a fully, a fundamental way of changing the way that, uh, that we think, right? So I actually do know all my phone numbers. 
don't dial that, that's my mom's number. Um, um, but I, I do know that. So I think what, what you're getting to is a, a eh, it's a hard question. What, what you're getting to, I think, Vago, is, is how do we fundamentally use something differently? What we tend to do is we just replace what we had last year. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, so my question is, why am I buying that? If I'm replacing something, wh why am I replacing it? Well, sir, because the old one's worn out. Well, you didn't answer the question. So an analysis of alternatives, which I do a lot of, an AOA, they'll say, well, sir, here's the analysis of alternatives. We're going to do A, B, and C. Well, those are just replacements for that. One of the analysis must be, or one of the alternatives must be, I stop doing that, period. I accept risk and I stop doing it. Or, hey, we've got this new technology. Okay, well, and so the battalion is now going to be better suited. Why are we talking about a battalion? Why aren't we talking about a platoon? And the commandant talks about that. He says, hey, we're currently or we're not slated to go down to the platoon level. We're, we don't, uh, for distributed ops, why can't we do that? Why can't a platoon operate? But that goes back to education, training of a lieutenant who's still just 24 years old. And so you can't hustle your way to maturity. You, you, we have to actually train someone to maturity. There's a reason special operators are 35, 36. How do I, how do I distribute myself across those vast distances uh, of the Pacific with the current crop of lieutenants, staff, and SEALs I have. One other thing that I wanted to hit on that, on distances. The, the way you get over the distances is you distribute yourself. You literally distribute yourself and you're always there. You're persistent. It's almost like a rock, the analogy I use, like a rock in a shoe, right? It may not be existentially threatening, but until you get the rock out of your shoe, you can't think about anything else. Our goal is to be, to persist everywhere across the Pacific in small units that are uh, sustainable, survivable, and lethal using the technologies that we have now to make a platoon able to do sea denial. I mean, that's, that's not even something that was contemplated a few years ago, that a, a platoon of 40 could actually cause a change in a great power competition, because if I have systems that will control out to you know 500 miles, 600 miles, 350 miles, that causes you to change. If you're changing, then the other forces that are the other uh, naval forces that are actually opposed to you are gaining time because you're doing whatever it is that I chose for you to do. I caused you to change as opposed to you just coming to do the mission that you wanted. That's kind of where we're going. Uh, broad answer. Um, and uh, what we would, we're going to have a follow up conversation to this where we can dive a little bit more deeply yeah. in it. But how do you address? two key parts of this. One is logistics. If you talk to General, uh, to Admiral, uh, retired United States Navy Admiral uh, Busby, uh, he will tell you, hey, I don't have enough uh, sea lift as the maritime uh, administrator. Uh, and yet the nation hasn't prioritized that. We look at, for example, the oiler fleet. It's actually insignificant to be able to take combat losses and support uh, the Navy's uh, voracious fuel consumption uh, that will happen, for example, in a high intensity situation. And if you look at the distributed lift you have as a Marine Corps, there's been a focus on the big amphibs. How do you, how do you neck down your logistics requirements, right? We have a multiplicity of systems that have very, very uncommon logistics streams to them, right? F-35 was supposed to be more um, sustainable and supportable than is proven. Each one of the variants is a little bit different. So how do you address the necking down? How important a requirement is it to neck down number of spare parts, number of unique attributes? And the second thing is, how do you distribute a force to be able to operate at distance, at speed, because those 40 Marines will be vulnerable to modern hypersonic weapons, for example, right? They're immobile. How do you move them? How do, how do you operate in this environment on those two vectors? Yes, yeah, so the, the first question is easy. How important is it? It's, it's vital. It's crucial that you have a streamlined system of supply of parts. Parts commonality is really important. I mean, true parts commonality, so that I can interchange this from this from this. Because what, what you ultimately come down to is the one vehicle that you need to actually operate right now, that critical vehicle that's carrying the payload and you don't have enough time to swap vehicles, I need to be able to pull part X off of this other vehicle that doesn't have the payload loaded because I don't have the 30 minutes to change payload, but I have the 10 minutes to change the part. So parts commonality is vital. It makes it easier for downstream working of, uh, of our supply chain. How do you distribute the force? You got to be there. And I think one of the things you do is, frankly, the stuff that, that is the heaviest and bulkiest, obviously, is the armaments and the munitions, and then anything that's liquid, POL, um, you know, petroleum. So we can self-sustain ourselves with food and water. We know that, especially in the Pacific, right? We can do that. The technology exists to do very, very lightweight sustainment of the individual person. Um, 
for the weaponry, that's got to be pre in, in my opinion, it has to be ready to be pre-staged. Either it's mobile and it's floating, or it is pre-staged in spots with our allies. And that's the other piece that I think uh, is involved with this, the strategy piece of the allies and partners, the line of effort number two from our NDS. You know, then Secretary Mattis focused on that very heavily. And that's what we fo I focused on that almost, not exclusively, but very heavily within uh, the three MEF theater when I was there, working with our allies throughout the region. Because if you can pre-stage, then you are already inside ready to persist. But the pre-staging piece, it's, it's how do you get there and not have to do the resupply? Because the resupply is a physics problem. Things weigh X, distances Y. So how do I get over that? Well, you build more craft, which is expensive, and then you have, but by building more that is expensive, that's also more things to target. And at some point, there's a cost imposition placed on an enemy, where if I have 50 of these things that are moving, only two of them contain cargo that you really care about. You pick which two. I've imposed cost on you. So there's a benefit to that, but that costs money. And then also, if you can pre-stage, then that reduces my, my need to actually move things into theater, because I already live inside the WES. And that's the key to what the Commandant's talking about. How do you persist inside the WES? You bring it with you in times when you don't need to transport it under or in extremis, if you will. So how do you bring it and keep it with you? Uh, one of the things you talked about is hypersonics. How does that platoon move? They, they will be mobile. They're going to have to be mobile and more than just foot mobile, whether it's a vehicle, whether it's a surface connector that travels with them or whether it's aircraft. We do have to be able to move those those Marines, those platoons. And the same thing that would move the, the resupply can also move the personnel. And uh, last uh, question. The United States is under the Inter uh, Intermediate uh, Range Nuclear Forces Agreement. Each of the military services is working to develop longer sticks. Uh, I love that uh, Bob workism uh, of, of managing to outstick your opponent. How, how are you working with uh, the Army, the Air Force, as well as the Navy as a whole suite and, and new generations of systems are under consideration to give uh, U.S. forces that precision uh, as well as potentially area denial uh, capability. Yeah, so I'll give you a, a fairly short answer. Um, so I'm actually talking to all three services now. Uh, as far as the, the, the broad uh, construct of how are we working with them, I'm talking to Jim Kilby, uh, Vice Admiral Kilby, almost every day. Sorry, I got a little bug there. Uh, I'm heading down to Austin on Sunday uh, to see Army Futures Command General Murray. And then I've got a, I think I got a VTC set up for uh, this week or next week with uh, Tim Fay, Lieutenant General Fay in the Air Force, because we don't, what we don't want to do is have four parallel tracks. We want to be part of the joint force, but we have to trust the joint force. I have X capabilities, you have Y capabilities. We are truly part of a joint force. So everybody is moving toward longer range. We know that. Um, but I don't necessarily have to have my own thing. That's sometimes a criticism of the Marine Corps is we think we have to have our own. Uh, Secretary Gertz likes to say, um, sometimes the Marine Corps, you guys want your own railroad, why don't you just buy a ticket? Um, that's what I'm trying to figure out if we, as we do force development. What do I have to own and what can I rely on my partners and allies to own so I don't need to do that? But longer range, I mean, like you said, the Commandant has specifically said in his guidance he's looking for about 350 miles on things. Um, that's still on the, on, the, on the short side, right? 350, but short of that, you're not putting much at risk. We need to get out to 350 and beyond. And that is going to eventually be, quote, industry standard. So all three services, all four services, the other three, I'll be talking to starting on Monday. Lieutenant General Eric Smith, who is uh, the commander of the United States Marine Corps Combat Development Command, sir. It was an honor and pleasure and look forward to coming down and seeing you at sunny Quantico. Yeah, you're always welcome at Quantico. It'll be a good time. Look forward to seeing you.